And number two, I'm glad the Lord is here. Let's sing this old hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. It's on page 17 in the hymnal. Would you stand together with me? Come thy fount of every blessing in my heart to sing thy praise. Dreams of mercy never ceasing, calls for songs of loudest praise. It's be some melodious song, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon, mount of thy standing for just a moment and open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41, and we're going to read a couple of passages in just a moment. We're going to ask the Lord blessings upon our study and our gathering together today. Father, I stretch Genesis chapter 41, and we're going to read three or four verses. First, verses 15 and 16. Genesis 41, verses 15 and 16. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there's none that can interpret it. And I've heard say of thee that thou canst understand the dream to interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Now verse 25. Verse 25. And Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. Pharaoh had had two dreams. And he said they're both the same dream with just different images, same lesson. God hath showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. Now verse 28. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he shows unto Pharaoh. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word and let God's people say praise the Lord. And you may be seated. Thank you. I want to thank my, my son Trace also for coming today to play. He's not well, as they say in England, unwell. <laughs> 
but I appreciate him coming and showing up and playing for us this morning. Now, in our last study, we learned that Joseph has lived in the presence of God. I think it is now fitting in these series of studies for Joseph that we start our verse-by-verse study. This is what I am used to doing, and this is the best means, I believe, of teaching God's Word. You know, the whole point of coming together to worship is to worship the Lord. So what that means is, it means, number one, that the primary purpose of worshiping the Lord is for the people of God. It's for the believers. It's for those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're here among us and you're not a believer, we pray for you that the Lord will make you jealous and put an interest in your heart to seek the Lord and to come to know the Lord that we profess. And so from this point forward, I'm going to be teaching in a verse-by-verse fashion, drawing out lessons from these verses, God willing, until we conclude the story of Joseph. By my count, this is study number 50 or 51, and I've chosen for the subtitle of this study, What God Has Shown Pharaoh. And we will see how far along we get. Now, in the previous study, we learned that Joseph lived in the presence of God. How is that possible? How is that possible for us? There's really two principles here. Number one, to believe God. And number two, to believe His Word. The promises of God form the foundation for our faith, and the Son of God is the object of our faith. We have the written word, which is the foundation of our faith, and we have the living word, who's revealed in the written word as the object of our faith. Now, the written word of God stands upon the promises of God. Think about it. What would the Bible mean to you if there were not promises in the Bible for you and for me? The promises of God stand upon the oath of God. He's not only promised, but he has promised with an oath. He has sworn. And then the oath of God stands upon the immutable, that is the unchangeable person of God, the God who cannot lie. And you can find a reference for that in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. So those who believe God are those who live upon his word. For us, life does not consist in the abundance of things, in the things that we possess, but in the truths that we receive from the Word of God. As we read, life is not about bread alone, whether by bread you mean substance, what you eat, or whether by bread you mean, as we mean today, give me some bread, brother, I need alone. It doesn't consist in those things, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. And my friends, those who live upon the word of God are those who can live in the presence of God. Now listen to the words of Moses to the children of Israel as found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 6. Listen to what Moses said to the children of Israel. He said, These words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. There it is on the board for you. Shall be in their heart. You need to get it from your head, 18 inches down, into your heart, to your soul, to your mind, your spirit. It needs to be like the breakfast you had this morning. I might could take certain things from you, but I can't take from you what you ate this morning. It's part of you now. And so you get this, the word of God into your heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Now, I am for Bible studies for children. I'm not against that. But your parents must know that it cannot be accomplished in an hour a week or 45 minutes a week what you are commanded to accomplish during the week. You shall teach them diligently unto your children. Listen to this now. You talk of them when you sit in your house, when you're at leisure. 
And when you walk by the way, business. And when you lie down, when you retire at the end of the day. And when you rise up in the morning, first thing on your mind. Thank you, Lord. This is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon your hand. This is when you work. And they shall be as frontless between your eyes in your thoughts. And thou shalt write them upon the post of your house and on your gates. That's a testimony to everybody else that passes by. Then from Deuteronomy 11, basically the same thing, beginning in verse 18, Thou shalt lay up these words in your heart and in your soul, memorize them, bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontless between your eyes, teach them to your children, speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you write them upon the doorpost of your heart and upon your gates." I'll tell you, if we live in the Word, if we think on the Word, if we put the Word on the refrigerator and on the freezer, if you put something on your front door for you when you come home, or when strangers come to your home as a testimony to them, you're living in the presence of God. And this is how Joseph survived all of the things that came his way. If we live in the Word, we'll be walking according to the revealed will of God, which is in his word, and when we live according to the revealed will of God, we will find that the secret will of God will constantly and continuously open doors for us. And this is what now is about to happen to Joseph. Look at verse 14 of Genesis chapter 41, verse 14. And Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself, and he changed his clothing, and he came in under Pharaoh. The Lord, even though Joseph has been through all kinds of things, all kinds of trials, all kinds of trouble, now the time has come the Lord is going to open the door for him. Because he's been constantly looking to the Lord. He's been trusting in the Lord. He's been Waiting on the Lord. Let me ask you a question. You say, well, what if I don't know what to do? All right, let me give you a little advice. When you don't know what to do, wait. Wait. Don't take action. You'll get in trouble. Just wait on the Lord. The most difficult thing to do, waiting on the Lord, is difficult. When you don't know what to do, don't do something. Just wait. Wait. Wait on the Lord, because you say, well, this doesn't make sense. I don't know what's going on. Yes, but it makes sense to God. And he knows what he's doing. And we're not on our schedule. Wait on the Lord. All right, here's number one today, verse 14. Joseph was called out of prison, verse 14, and into Pharaoh's presence. Now keep in mind that there was absolutely no hope for Joseph. But we worship a God who makes a way out of no way. And those who live in and by the word of God, hoping in the God of the word, will find a way out of no way. Somehow you'll find, as Joseph did, that the Lord will send what you need to do what you must. Financial Needs, clothing, housing, your needs will be met. This is what David said in Psalm 37, verse 25. He said, I've been young, and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, to the church at Philippi, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, he may not always remove the obstacles. He certainly did not remove all of them for Joseph, but he will make a way through them. And Joseph and the events that transpired in his life are examples of that. The Lord 
moved on the chief butler. You remember Joseph was in prison with two fellows and they had dreams and he interpreted the dreams. And one of them was the chief butler who was restored to his former position. Uh, and Joseph said, when you get out of here, would you remember me? Mention me to the Pharaoh. And of course, he forgot Joseph. He proved ungrateful and unfaithful. So, the Lord gave the Pharaoh a dream. And by giving the Pharaoh a dream, the Lord put the butler in a situation where to testify of Joseph would be to his advantage. And so he freely testified of Joseph. All right, verse 15. The Pharaoh told Joseph why he was called to appear before him. Chapter 41 and verse 15. He says, I've dreamed a dream and nobody can interpret it. And somebody told me you could interpret dreams. He tells Joseph why he was called to appear before him. And here's what we see first in Pharaoh, and I've mentioned this several times in these studies. We see in Pharaoh that the unbeliever, and Pharaoh is not a believer in the God of Joseph. So we see in the Pharaoh that the unbeliever will be used to advance God's people and God's purpose and God's program. The Pharaoh was a superstitious man, and I know he was because according to verse 24, he surrounded himself with magicians, occultists, and astrologers. He looked to them to tell him about what he needed to do. Now, the apparent purpose for calling Joseph was the Pharaoh's dream. He wanted an understanding of his dream. He wanted an interpretation. But the unapparent purpose was to advance God's program through Joseph. In every action and reaction in this world, there is an apparent and an unapparent purpose. And what does that mean, Brother Sasser? It means this. Everything is therefore significant. We've got a big God, and He only does big things. It may seem like a small thing to you, but everything is significant. Everything. If you live in the revealed will of God, you'll see everything work out for your good and His glory. All right, number three from verse 16. Joseph gave a good testimony to the Pharaoh, a testimony which gave all the glory to the Lord. When the Pharaoh said, I've heard you can interpret dreams, Joseph said, no, it's not in me, verse 16, but it is God who will show Pharaoh and give an answer of peace to him. So Joseph gives a good testimony to the Pharaoh, a testimony that gave all the glory to the Lord. Now listen, children of God, never, 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 don't let me hear you, but certainly don't let heaven hear you give credit to blind chance or luck. I see people on television and they've been spared from a tornado and they said, I was lucky. Nothing is behind luck, but God is behind providence. Always strive to give the Lord credit. You know, all the characters in the Bible, you just check them out. You don't have to believe me. All of the characters in the Bible always blamed God for everything. They always blame God. For example, you're thinking God has anything to do with death or with the length of life. Well, listen to this. Job chapter 14, verse 5. His days are determined, and the number of his months are with thee, and thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. That's talking about you and me and the years or the days of the years of our lives. You know, the Bible doesn't talk about the years of our life. It talks about the days of the years of our life. We are to go through this life one day at a time. And it says, 
His days are determined. The number of his months are with thee. You have appointed his bounds and he can't pass. In Acts chapter 5, when Ananias and his wife Sapphira fell down dead, the apostle said, guess what? He said, God killed him. When Jesus was asked about the blind man of John chapter 9, did he sin? Is that why he's born blind? Did his parents sin? Is that why he was born blind? Jesus said, I want you to know something. Neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but he was born blind that the works of God might be revealed through him. When Job lost everything he had, you know what he said? He said, I came into this world naked, and I will leave this world naked. The Lord gave me everything I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Job 1.21. We have the tendency to blame the devil on bad things and blame God for good things. But believe me, the devil can't do anything without the permission of the Lord. And so we have to say to the Lord, what are you doing, Lord? What do you want me to do? Well, one thing is to trust him. Joseph knew that the Lord had given Pharaoh the dream and that the Lord could tell him what his dream meant. He knew that the Lord could bring blessing and the Lord could bring prosperity in Egypt, but the Lord could also bring cursing and bankruptcy into Egypt. And this is what he says in verses 25 and 28. God hath showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. So the question I ask myself, is the God of Joseph my God? Then when I have opportunity, let me give him credit. Let me give him the glory. Let me learn what thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory means. All right, number four, verses 17 through 24 the Pharaoh told Joseph his dream. Now let me say something about dreams. In the past, before the Son of God, the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ, before he came into the world, the Lord used dreams, he used prophets, and he used other mediums to speak to men. But with the coming of the Son of God, he has eliminated all the means of talking to us but two, the written word and the living word. Now, I didn't say this. The word of God says that. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It's on the board for you. God, who at sundry times, at many times, and in many different ways, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, how is he speaking now? He has in these last days, and I often point this out, the last days began with the birth of Christ. We've been in the last days for over 2,000 years. What is a day to God? What is a thousand years to an eternal God? Nothing. He says he has spoke in time past by the prophets. He has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom he made the world. You might be shocked if you knew how many people don't believe this and don't know this. Many people still talk about dreams in the last few years. There's been a lot of books written about dreams and angels. And I believe in dreams and angels, but I don't believe in looking to those dreams or thinking I'm being led by an angel when I've got the Word of God. I'm going to walk according to the Word of God and let God do what He wants to do with His angels. But I know for sure that I have a sure testimony in the written Word of God. So let me get familiar with that. Let me walk according to that. And God will take care of the providential events in my life. Multitudes are looking for this and looking for that and looking for other, uh, other things when we have the completed Word of God. Now, I watched, I'm not picking on her, but I watched most of Dolly Parton's special last Thursday evening, and I was greatly disappointed in it. And she, she founded the program on a lot of religious things. Because I was in music, I can read into things that she said, 
And she had one song, which I didn't write down. She had one song about saying how we're all whoever we are and we can be straight and we can be gay and we can be whatever. And uh, God loves us all just like we are. That's not true. That is not true. I'm sorry. But here's what she said. I wrote this down. She said that she prays every day and she asked the Lord to show her the way. Well, Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm the way. I'm the truth. You want to know what the truth is about things? You, you get to know me. And I'm the life. And this is what Dolly said, and I quote this. She said, I hope I haven't crammed God or Jesus down anybody's throat tonight. I guess nobody knows for certain if there is a heaven. But if there is, I just hope to hell I go. Now, my friends, what did Jesus say in John chapter 14? Do you know those verses? He said, you believe in God, believe in me also. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, I'll tell you where heaven is. Heaven is where Christ is. It was Martin Luther who said, if I died and went to heaven and Christ went in heaven and I looked down in hell and Christ was in hell, he said, I'd jump in hell because hell with Christ would be heaven. And heaven without Christ would be hell. Listen, heaven is not golden streets and walls of jasper and pearl. Heaven is to be in the presence with the one who loved us and gave himself for us. That is to be in heaven. You know, what I try to do all the time is cram God and Jesus down folks' throat. <laughs> I, 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 should do, I should be a better witness than I am. Not only when I'm teaching up here, but in my, in my life. Uh, you can't be around Lynn very long. She's going to bear witness to you. She flies on airplanes. She sits next to the person. She prays about it. And she feels like the Lord puts her in the certain seat he puts her in. And she strikes up a conversation and she ends up witnessing to those people on that plane. And that's the way we should be. We should be that way. My friends, Jesus spoke more about hell than he did heaven. And if there is a hell to shun, there is a heaven to gain. And the way there is not through dreams or establishing charities or other good works. That's all good. But it's through Christ and Christ alone that we gain heaven. God only, I want to say this, capital O, capital N, capital L, capital Y, underscore twice, God only speaks today by his written word through his son, the living word. In fact, Jesus is the theme of the written word. As I've quoted so many times, John 5, verse 39 and 40, you study the scriptures in them you think you have eternal life. The scriptures testify of me, but you will not come to me that you might have life. Folks will go to church, they'll give money, they'll do many wonderful and charitable things, but they will not come to Christ, who is the life that they're seeking for. And as for dreams and prophets, would you turn in your Bibles to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy? You got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the five books of Moses. And let's look in Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13. Here's what he says, beginning in verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet, a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, he does something that's wonderful, that's miraculous, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass. The sign of the wonder whereof he spake unto thee, saying, 
Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Verse 3, thou shalt not hearken, thou shalt not listen to the words of that prophet or the dreamer of those dreams. For the Lord your God is only proving you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Verse 4, you shall walk, that's what I've been telling you, living in the presence of God, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him. That is, have reverence and respect only for him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet, verse 5, or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death, because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage, to thrust thee out of the way whence the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in, so shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. Boy, I'll tell you, there are a lot of folks today that ought to be glad we're not under the law of Moses. Because <laughs> occultism, spiritism, witches and warlocks are on the ascendancy. They're everywhere. They're, on the, they're on the, not only on the uh, uh, internet, but they're in these movies that they're making. Walt Disney recently put out a movie, I think it's out right now, in which the characters in there are neither male nor female. Some of them are gay, some of them are lesbians, but they're all in cartoon characters. And what does that to do? That's to influence the minds, the young minds of children who go and watch those things. I wouldn't go and I wouldn't let my children go. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. False prophets, notice verses 1 and 2 of this Deuteronomy chapter 13. In verses 1 and 2, false prophets may give signs and wonders which come true. We read that in the New Testament book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I want you to notice, however, that such signs and wonders will serve to seduce the faith of the people and cause them to trust in the prophet or in the sign or wonder or in the God that the prophet and not in the living God. Anything that draws your attention away from Christ and to a man is not of God. I'm telling you, don't follow me. If you follow me just a little while, you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> I'm going to say or do something that's going to disappoint you. And you ought to be disappointed. You only will not be disappointed if you're looking to Christ. Christ and Christ alone. Remember this, whatever does not serve to strengthen faith weakens it. Whatever word is not supported by the written word of God is a false word. This is what Isaiah the prophet said, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. He says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Paul told the Galatians, Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, he said, Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel than that which you have received, let him be cursed. And Jeremiah had this to say about dreams in Jeremiah chapter 23, beginning in verse 25. The Lord said, I have heard what the prophet said that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. The prophet that has a dream, let him tell a dream. He that has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat? saith the Lord. Jeremiah 23, verses 25, 28. In the days before the Messiah came, the one we know as Jesus, God may have spoken by dreams, but don't pay any attention to your dreams today as far as leading you or revealing things to you. 
Today, if you wish to hear from God, you approach him through his son, and the only true testimony regarding his son is in the written word of God. All right, lesson number five, verses 25 through 32. Joseph interpreted the Pharaoh's dreams. Joseph said these two dreams are really one dream, using various uh, uh, images to tell you something that God is going to do. Now, I often emphasize the sovereignty of God over all things, and I do that because I believe that the Spirit-inspired writers of Scripture do the same thing. The first thing out of Joseph's mouth is this, verse 25, God is in charge. He said God's going to show Pharaoh what he is about to do. There it is on the board for you. Well, wait a minute. Uh, He didn't ask my permission. Is he going to have to go to the United States government? What about the United Nations? God has showed Pharaoh what he's about to do. He says the same thing in verse 28. God is about to show Pharaoh what he is going to do. God does not need permission to do what he's about to do. He doesn't need a consensus to do what he is about to do. He's not asking for a vote to what he's about to do. I tell you, one of the worst lies I've ever heard, you don't hear it much anymore, but you used to hear it all the time, about salvation. They said, God voted for you and the devil voted against you. Now you cast a deciding vote. A bigger lie has never been told. A bigger lie has never been told. First of all, if you're dead and trespassed into sins, how are you going to cast a vote? You ever seen a dead man vote? Well, yeah, recently in these elections. <laughs> God does not need permission to be God. Now, but because he's gracious and because he's merciful, he's going to show you, Pharaoh, what he's about to do to give you an opportunity to prepare for it. Now, my friends, I believe, you don't have to uh, subject yourself to what I believe about these things. There are all kinds of uh, good brothers that have various and sundry views about eschatological or prophetic or last days truth. They got pre-millennials, you've got split millennials, you've got post-millennials, you've got our millennials, you've got pan-millennials that's going to all pan out. You've got all kind of millennials, but I'll tell you this, and I'm going to show you from the scripture in just a moment what I think, that I believe God has shown us what he's about to do in the last days. He said there will come false Christ. You got your seatbelts on? I believe the Pope is a false Christ. I don't believe that any man can pray for somebody else's sins to be absolved, and they're absolved. I don't believe that you should go and confess your sins to any man. You confess your sins to God, and you confess your faults to one another. That's what the Scripture says. The government is a false Christ. People are now depending on the government for all their needs instead of the Lord. Buddha is a false Christ. Muhammad is a false Christ. They're going to come false Christ, he said, in the last days. God has told us what he's about to do. Number two, he said there's going to be great deception in the last days. He said many will be deceived. Thirdly, there's going to be perversion in the last days. Men will seek to pervert the order created by the Lord from the beginning. The LGBTQ movement seeks to legitimize the perversion of gender and of marriage and of relationships. The movement to legitimize the marriage of two men or of two women is a perversion of God's created order of marriage. And that's why I wouldn't go to any movie that shows that. I wouldn't watch any TV program that shows that. I wouldn't let my children go to any cartoon shows that emphasize that or show that. The forbidden use of pronouns to correctly identify 
and distinguish between males and females is an attempt to pervert gender. The Lord has showed us what he's about to do. Number four, the increase of wars, the growing conflict between cultures, the increasing disturbances in nature point to what God is about to do. The Lord Jesus said, nation shall rise against nation. That word is ethnos, ethnic groups, cultures, and kingdom, basalia is the word, government against government. And there'll be famines. You know, millions of people are starving to death in this world. We're not starving yet in America, but millions of people are starving to death. There'll be famines, there'll be pestilences. The word translated pestilence is the word from which we get our term virus in most cases. We just had the coronavirus, we're going to have more of it. There are going to be earthquakes in many places. And Jesus said, all of these are the beginnings of sorrows. Number five, he's, he has told us what he's about to do. He said, the open and legally enforced persecution and prosecution of God's believing people will begin to happen in the latter days. Christians are being singled out all over the world, and it's beginning to happen here in the United States. Because we don't follow these perverted lies, these satanic lies, we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, there's going to be legally enforced persecution and prosecution of God's believing people. I said years and years and years ago that the time will come. First of all, they'll restrict the teaching of the Bible to the church building. And now, with the Internet and with it all going out over there, they'll finally begin to restrict that as hate speech. And that is beginning to happen, too. Number six, there will come a falling away. Many will deny Christ. Many will leave the churches, the visible churches. Many will be offended. Many will begin to betray one another, turn one another over to the government, and hate one another. Now, would you turn, I'll, I'll tell you what, I can just read this for you, but I'll tell you where I've Get it. I'm going to kind of define it for you. 2 Timothy chapter 3 is a good summary of these things. I'm going to tell you what each one of these words means. 2 Timothy chapter 3 in the New Testament is a good, a good summary of everything I've said. This is what he says in verse 1. He says, This know that in the last days... Perilous times shall come. The word perilous comes from a, a term that means difficult or dangerous times will come. Verse 2, for men will be lovers of their own selves. That's a word that means they'll be selfish. It says they'll be covetous. That means they'll be greedy. They'll be boasters and proud. That means they'll be conceited. They'll be blasphemers, that is, they will be insulting. They will speak evil without blushing of sacred things. They'll be disobedient to parents, unthankful. The word really is ungrateful. Unholy, that means they'll be irreligious. They not only won't be religious, they'll be against anybody who is in their terms of religion, irreligious. Without natural affection, they'll be unkind. They won't love what they should naturally love because it gets in the way of their life. Truce breakers, that is liars who will not keep covenant, who will not keep their word. False accusers from a word that means slanderer. What do we call the one Lucifer? What do we call him? We call him the slanderer. You know what devil means? Devil and Satan means accuser and slanderer. And so they're going to be slanderous. Devil is going to be working overtime. 
in the last days. If men don't want to have anything to do with God, he's just going to let the devil have them. I mean, didn't Chris Christopherson write, let the devil take tomorrow? Isn't that what he wrote? A very popular song. I know all of you have heard it. You probably know the lyrics to it. I just want to make it through the night. <laughs> let the devil take tomorrow. Well, he's taking it. Truth breakers, liars, won't keep covenant, false accusers, slanderers, incontinent. That means they're out of control. They're haters of any kind of order and decency. It says fierce. That means they're savage. They're going back to like the civil or uncivilized, you know, years and years and years ago, a man wrote a book called something like the, uh, the Civilized Savage. He was trying to show that if you really understand the savages, they really had more order and all of that than we have in our modern civilization. Well, people today are doing everything they can to go back and act like savages. Everything they can. Unthankful for God delivering them from all of that and bringing them into a nation that at one time at least espoused the gospel. Now we're trying to go back to what we were delivered out of. He says, despisers of those that are good. Traitors. They'll betray one another. Despisers of those that are good. Traitors. Heady and high-minded. That means they're going to be swollen with pride. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. That simply means that the flesh and self will rule the day. Having a form of godliness. Oh, they'll talk about God. They'll talk about love. They'll talk about loving people. God loves everybody. Well, I can show you passages in this scripture that says God hates the workers of iniquity. He might love men that with a general benevolence in that he permits them to continue to live in his world, but he doesn't love them with a redemptive love. He only loves those with a redemptive love who love his son. Don't you ever let anybody tell you that God loves people who spit in his face with a redemptive love. He does not. With a love of benevolence, yes. But not with a redemptive love. He says here, going on in 1 Timothy chapter 3, he says that they will have a form of godliness, but they will deny the power that is, they will ad adhere to the outward form of religion. They'll be sure to go to some form of worship and mass and everything else to keep up the show of it, but they're not ruled by it. From such turn away of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with many different kinds of lust, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Number eight, God has showed us what he's about to do. He says that lawlessness will become the order of the day in the last days. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And that word iniquity is the word anomia, means against the law. It's a total disregard for law and order. When people go into grocery stores and just pack up and walk out with that merchandise, when people kill folks at will for nothing, when some people push somebody in front of a subway for no reason, when people take elderly people and knock them down with a baseball bat, that is utter disregard for life and for law and order. Number nine, this will characterize the last days, the means of the possibility of hearing the gospel from any place on earth will become a reality. And for the first time in history, this is now possible by means of the internet. As the final days of the last days come upon earth, the human race will become more and more like the wicked generation of Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah. 
we may sum it up with this phrase, they'll be wiser, yet more wicked. Going to the moon, understanding the cells, going into the subatomic world, doing amazing things, but with that, more wicked. Joseph told the Pharaoh, God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. And that means, Mr. Pharaoh, that God is in total control. And he's about to do something, and there's nothing you can do about it, sir. But in his great compassion, he's given you an advance notice so you can prepare. May the Lord add his blessings to the teaching of his word. Let's stand together. My dear friends, the day of the Lord hastens upon us. Are we ready for what is coming upon the face of the earth? Are we ready for what may be coming to America sooner than you think? I believe in standing for righteousness. I believe in standing for God's word. I don't have to go out and wave a flag to do it. I'm not against waving flags. I think you ought to be patriotic and stand for America. In fact, I believe that the scriptures teach nationalism. See, God divided the nations and each nation is to try to do what they can for themselves. But we recently had a president that said, American first. I want America to be first. I'm the president of America, not president of the world. And what now, he went through four years of lies. Now there are more lies. He's made mistakes, hasn't he, recently? He's made some real bad mistakes. But I tell you this, unless God sends somebody and blesses them, and overthrows all of these things that will take away your liberties and your freedoms, we are done for. Amen. Some of you young people will, will see those days. I and some of the others who are here who advanced in age, we may not see them. But you will. And they're going to be days where you'll look back and you say, man, I remember back in 20." 20 and 2022, when we had freedom, we could do this and we could do that, and that's gonna all going to be taken from you. Over in Russia, I have heard pretty good reports. I don't want to start any innuendo and rumors, but I've heard pretty good reports that Mr. Putin has cancer. Now, somebody else will take his place. Over in China, China's slave labor. China can pay a man $10 a week. Do you think that a, a society like America, who is a capitalistic society, that means you either work or you want. That means you have to work or you go hungry. That means that when you invest something, you expect to return on it. Capitalism means you get a profit on, on your work. You, you, you get a reward for your work. Do you think we can compete with a nation of what, a billion people? How many people in China? 1.4 billion, Dr. Foster says, that has slave labor. I tell you, you need to pray for those people that are revolting over there now. If they'll all join together, they can overthrow that government. And we ought to pray for the Chinese. And there are multitudes of Christians in China. Because over there, you don't have any many false professions. <laughs> you become a Christian over there, you're going you're gonna to die for it. I need to let you go, but I'll tell you one little story that I've told several times, but it's been a few years, so you, you won't remember it. <laughs> In Russia, I'm old enough to remember when the Soviet Union was a power, and they would not permit any. They took all of the churches in Russia and made them into cathedrals of science, and uh, they forbade any kind of... Uh, uh, worship, uh, Bibles were outlawed and so on. And so there were some Christians meeting, and they were meeting underground, as we say. They were meeting in a secret place. And one night, there were only about 25 of them in Russia when it was under communism. And uh, one night when they were meeting, three or four armed guards came in. 
And they had these guns that could kill them all in, you know, 10 seconds. And they said, we're going to give you an opportunity tonight like you're never going to have again in your life. If you're not really a Christian, you want to leave this meeting, we're going to let you get out of here. Because we think you kill everybody else. And most of them, not half of them left. And they gave them another warning. And when they was pretty sure that all the Christians had left, they put their guns up and they said, good, we're Christians too. We came down here to worship with you. What would you do if you were faced with something like that? My friends, it may come. Well, God has showed us, just like he showed Pharaoh, he has shown us what he's about to do. And we need to batten down the hatches, and we need to be looking to the Lord, and we need to be reading his word and memorizing his word and committing his word to our heart and teaching his word to our children. We can't do it an hour on Sunday morning. you got to do it seven days a week. Go ahead and do what you can. You'll never regret it. All right, let's sing Under the Blood of Christ. If you are not a believer and you would like to talk to me about confessing Christ, we'd love to have you do that. Under the blood of Jesus, safe in the shepherd's fold. Under the blood of Jesus, Let me dismiss you and uh, let me encourage you this week to invite somebody to come out and worship with us here at Grace Church. Uh, Offer to bring them if you can. Uh, Take these tracks that we have out here. We have a new track, what what, what the law demands, grace provides in Christ. Take any of those tracks that you can prayerfully use and drop them out somewhere Drop them in mailboxes if you want to, or leave them in the post office, or leave them in a restaurant under your plate or something. You never know what may happen to them. And uh, may I pray the Lord will give you a good week this week. All right, let us pray. Father, we call upon you in the name of the Lord Jesus. How we thank you that you've given us a warning sign that the bridge is out up ahead. We've been approaching this at breakneck speed here in the United States. Pray that you will strengthen and help your people, that we may walk in your light and learn your word and study your word and memorize your word, commit it to memory, and ask you to help us to walk according to the light that we have in it, that we might be prepared for what's up ahead. We know that Jesus is the bridge. He is this bridge that spans the distance between earth and heaven. He is the Jacob's ladder. And Father, we would cross over to thee through faith in him. I ask you to bless your word this morning, though it has been poorly delivered, weakly set forth. The strength is not in the messenger, but in the message and in the God of that message. Bless it. Use it for the good of your people, the glory of your name, the salvation of those who do not belong to Christ. And now may the God of all grace cause his face to shine upon you and to bless you in all your ways as you walk in his light. Through Christ Jesus the Lord, I pray for his sake. Amen.